One, Enmix can't pull off Coachella, after the Loose Seraphim disaster, people started tossing around names of groups that could own the Coachella stage, with Enmix being one of them. But aside from their vocals, their tracks just don't scream Coachella vibes. Their music is childish, with no songs that could actually hype up the crowd, even for stage presence, they're not on par with Blackpink, 2NE1, ATs, and even Le Seraphim, excuse me? Is this subscriber for real? What a brain dead take, it's literally a music festival where drunk people go to have fun, it was never that deep, if s -Pa can sing about novice we love you, and mix and their zero coke are welcome, their vocals, stellar, their tracks, maybe not your cup of tea, but let's not pretend Coachella is the opera, it's a desert bash where the glitter and beer flow more freely than water, now, onto this Coachella pedestal situation, since when did a festival become the Grammy's red carpet, it's a playground for music lovers to discover new jams, not some exclusive club where only the worthy can drop the beat, stands can sometimes act like their faves just split the atom when they book a western gig, props to idols for their Coachella moment, but that doesn't mean they're the gatekeepers of festival vibes, and this whole western appealing song criteria? Last time I checked, Coachella didn't have a bouncer checking tracks at the door, and Mix's pop beats are as legit as any, and if S-Pa can get the crowd bouncing with their experimental sound, and Mix aren't exactly singing in hieroglyphics, are they? 2. What do you think of people who stand idols like the Magne of Eunice, Sowen, who's literally 13 years old, is this even a question? This girl literally just graduated elementary school, I'm done, literally I'm done. Standing a 13-year-old kid is like cheering for a toddler who's just figured out how to walk without bumping into furniture, sure, the talent might be there, but let's be real, they're barely out of diapers in the grand scheme of things, it's like watching a kid play pretend. Except this game of dress-up is broadcasted to millions and comes with a side of unrealistic expectations and pressure, it's also wild. That in a place like South Korea, where education is practically worshipped, there's no cap on how young these idols can start working. And the parents? They're the ones signing off on this, trading lunchboxes for light sticks. it's not just the companies, it's the folks who should be safeguarding their kids' childhood who are tossing it out for money, it's so disturbing. It's like watching a puppy being trained for a circus instead of playing in the yard, even if the company plays nice and lets them hit school between gigs. The fact that we're even talking about work hours for someone who's has barely started middle school is bankers. The life of an idol is brutal. Even for grown-ups, these adults are cracking under the weight of being idol material. And we're expecting someone who's probably still scared of the dark to handle it 24-7? That's not just sad. It's a recipe for a breakdown. The mental toll is no joke. These kids are stuck in a perpetual state of adolescence, never evolving past the age they got thrown into the spotlight, the mental health risks are through the roof, these young idols are tossed into the deep end before they've even had a chance to learn how to swim in the real world, it's a twisted reality where childhood is swapped for choreography, and the price is paid in therapy sessions down the line, and the parents? They're the gatekeepers, the final line of defense, and if they're not stepping up, then who will? 3. Fans of groups like Blackpink and Stray Kids are way off base trying to link their faves to the Manhegan and Hive drama when there's no connection, they need to stop muddying the waters with made-up stories because these idols have nothing to do with it, I agree, the whole Manhegan debacle has become a magnet for all sorts of fandom drama, and honestly, it's a mess, it's like everyone's trying to jump on the bandwagon, using it as an excuse to air out their own grievances, whether they're Related or not, dragging groups like Big Bang, EXO, Blackpink, ATs, and Stray Kids into this? That's just reaching for straws, it's like some fans are on a mission to undermine hive groups, especially BTS, by twisting words and spreading half-baked truths, but let's not pretend this is a new low for fans, company stands I'm looking at you, they're ready to throw down for their faves, regardless of the sketchy history these companies have with idol treatment, it's wild that fans are so quick to defend entities like SM, JYP. YG, and Hybe, despite the fact that they've all had their share of controversies over how they manage their idols, it's like, wake up people. These companies are not your friends, they're businesses, and their bottom line isn't always in the best interest of the artists, so yeah, it's a circus. And not the fun kind, it's a cycle of misinformation, misplaced loyalty, and frankly, a lot of unnecessary noise. 4. Protest trucks and sending emails are great ways for fans to communicate with companies and help mistreated idols, oh, the infamous fan protest saga, fans are out there hitting send like it's going to magically solve all their idols problems, and the protest trucks? Please, it's like a parade of desperation rolling up to the company doors, the harsh truth? These companies aren't losing sleep over your protests, they've got their own agendas, and your email avalanche is just another thing for their interns to laugh at during coffee breaks, and let's not forget the times when fans have blown things way out of proportion, in Hypen's female backup dancers causing controversy?
That's the kind of trivial stuff that turns fan activism into a farce, sure, the industry has its dark corners, and groups like Luna and Omega X have faced real issues, but let's not pretend every fan complaint is a five-alarm fire, this constant my idol is getting mistreated narrative is getting old, they're artists, not charity cases, and they don't need a fan-led rescue mission for every hiccup in their career, plus, this whole thing turned out to another episode of the International vs. Korean Fan Feud, give me a break, both sides can be equally unreasonable, but everyone's too busy playing the blame game to see it, it's all about one-upping each other to prove who's the bigger fan, who's got the louder voice, who's the real savior of their idols, in the end, it's not about being a hero, it's about a misplaced sense of ownership, fans think they're the puppet masters of their idols' careers, they want to play the hero in their idols' story, they want to be the knight in shining armor, swooping in to save the day, but sometimes, you've gotta step back and ask yourself, is it really about them, or is it about you wanting that spotlight? 5. Being able to attract people with your visuals and beauty is also a talent, oh boy, here we go again, K-pop has this fixation on visuals, like if you've got the right cheekbones or a jawline that can cut glass, you're golden, but let's be honest, being born with symmetrical features isn't a skill, it's a genetic lottery win, sure, it's nice to look at, but it doesn't mean you've got what it takes to captivate an audience beyond the first glance, the whole visual role. It's a pretty package, but it's not the whole deal. You need that spark, that charisma, something that makes people watch you even when you're standing still. It's about having a vibe, an energy that's got nothing to do with how perfect your nose is. And yeah, there are idols who fit the beauty standards and also slay on stage like Won Young or Hyunjin. But let's not kid ourselves into thinking that good looks automatically grant you stage presence. Take Espa for example, the girls are two-tier visuals, but their stage presence during debut was non-existent, they had to hustle to improve and radiate that star quality on stage, it didn't come in the box with their visuals, they worked for it, and it showed, then you've got folks like RM, J-Hope, Soyeon, and Chong Bean, who might not be the poster children for visuals according to some, but put them on a stage, and they own it, they bring the heat, the passion. And that's what leaves the crowd screaming for more, that's talent, that's presence, that's what turns a performance into an experience. So, let's not reduce idols to just their looks, it's about time we give props for the real deal, the raw, magnetic pull that makes an idol unforgettable. 6. Why do fans always blame Kepler's mismanagement on Wake One and never on CJENM, when they hold HYBE accountable for their sublabel's mistreatment of groups, especially since we all know Wake One is a subsidiary label of CJENM, well well well, what an interesting question. Fans tend to have a selective outrage when it comes to holding companies accountable. And it's no different in the case of Kepler's management. Wake One gets the heat because they're the face of the music side of CJENM. And in the K-pop, the label directly managing the artists is always under the microscope. It's like blaming the waiter for a bad meal when the chef's the one cooking it up. Now, CJENM is massive, and their hands are in so many pots that it's easy for them to play the invisible puppeteer, they're not the ones directly interacting with the groups, so fans find it harder to point fingers at them. It's a classic case of out of sight, out of mind. On the flip side, Hybe's got their brand all over their groups. Bang Sihyuk isn't exactly shy about his involvement, and that's putting it mildly. He's front and center, which makes it a no-brainer for fans to hold him and Hybe accountable for everything, from the music to the promotions. So, yeah, it's not the same situation, but let's not kid ourselves. Hybe and CJENM probably work the same behind the scenes, CJENM keeps it hush, but that doesn't mean they're any less responsible, they're just better at hiding it. 7. Can you explain to me how the promotion of luxury brands by teenage idols is problematic, it's just clothes so I don't get it, yes it's problematic, the whole luxury brand endorsement game by teenage idols is a hot mess, it's like watching someone sell sand in the desert, pointless and a bit ridiculous, initially, you might think, what's the big deal? It's just clothes and bling but it's way deeper than that, first off, these idols are practically babies, and here they are, decked out in gear that costs more than what most folks make in a month, it's a bad look, it sends this message that you gotta be dripping in luxury to be cool, which is just nonsense, and let's not even start on the pressure it puts on the fans, you've got kids thinking they need to rock the same pricey stuff to fit in or be worth something, that's messed up, and the parents? They're busting their backs trying to keep up with these crazy standards, it's like a never-ending cycle of work, spend, repeat, for what? So their kid doesn't get side-eyed at school for not wearing the latest overpriced sneakers? Come on, then there's the bullying. It's no secret that if you're not keeping up with the new jeans, you're an easy target. It's a toxic culture that's all about flaunting what you've got. And if you don't got it, well, you're out of luck. The idols themselves are caught in this too. They're young, they're impressionable, and they're often not the ones calling the shots. They get handed these deals and told to smile for the camera. 
all while pushing products that most of their fans can't afford. Without skipping a few meals, and let's not forget the creepy factor of marketing adult luxury brands to teens, it's like they're trying to age these kids up, make them look older and more appealing. It's a stone's throw away from straight-up sexualization, and that's a line that should never be crossed, so yeah, it's a problem, a big one.